of the garden to the chaos of the fall. When we saw the Red Sea party, Jericho's tumbling walls. That was leading us to freedom. He would teach us to soul through every page of history. And you belong from the beginning to the ending. You're the center of it all. And it's for you and it's from you. You and you alone. The author of our story. Let it all be for your glory. From the beginning to the ending. You're the center of it all. From the promise of the prophet to the virgin bird to the one who healed the blind man was the king that came to serve on the cross you bore my burden took my sin down to the grave and on that Sunday morning you rolled the stone away from the beginning to the ending you're the center of it all and it's for you and it's from Welcome to the Community Christian Church. Hey, so if you're new here today, and I saw some new people here today, if you're new here today, just to let you know of a couple little things, we're going to have communion here in just a little bit, and there's cups up here to the side. If you want to grab one of those and be ready for that, you can do it during the song. Feel, feel free to do that. Feel comfortable doing that. No one's going to be upset because you left your seat for a second. All right, and if, uh, there, if you would, please, there's some little sheets on the chairs around there. Check that out. If you're new here today, please fill that out. Put it in the bucket. We got a little gift for you if you do that. And uh, if, if you are not new, you're as old as, I'm not going to mention any names because that's embarrassing. But anyway, if, you're, if you've been here for like forever, look on the back of that and there's some different things that you can sign up for. Uh, there's some events maybe possibly on there. I don't really know what's on there, but just, just look at it. Always look at that. That's important. All right. And uh, check that out. And uh, with that, let's, uh, let's get back to our praise and our worship. I tried to win this war, I confess. 
stuff that happens in the world. Jesus won. Jesus conquered death. And in everything, we can look to him for all the answers we'll ever need. So in this bridge, I want you to just plead out to God for the help that you need to get through everything that you're going to face this next week. So I was scrolling through Facebook yesterday, and I saw a post. Um, my beloved high school football coach uh, passed away just yesterday. And I don't know where Floyd Thomas was spiritually, but I know one thing that he always taught us and that really stuck with me. He'd say, boys, always keep your priorities straight. God should be first in your life. Your family should be second. School work third. And then football. And, and those lessons that he taught me were, were big and huge. And, and it wasn't just that. Floyd Thomas taught me about sacrifice. He taught me about giving yourself and everything you have for your team, for your family, for your education, and most of all, for God. He taught me that you sacrifice yourself and you give up of your time and your resources for that. And I learned that vividly in one game, and sorry, if you're not a sports fan, this could be a little boring. But in one particular game, we had, uh, this team was insurmountable odds, was supposed to beat the tar out of us. And so when we played them in the first drive of the game, they went right down the field and scored a touchdown, scored seven nothing. We get the ball, we have it three plays, we punt, they get the ball back, they're driving right down the field, Floyd Thomas calls a timeout. He comes out into the huddle, and I can, I'll can never forget it, he grabs me by the face mask, and he said, David Price, if you listen to me, we win this game. Do what I tell you and don't do anything else. If 34 lines up on your right, you slant to the right. If he lines up on your left, you slant to the left. I want you to hit him, I don't care if he has the ball or not, you hit him every play. We won the game 40 to 7. I learned that night. I couldn't choose to do what I wanted to do. I couldn't choose to do what, what I thought was best for me. I had to do what he told me to do as the commanding officer. Can you imagine Jesus being in heaven? 
right? And sometimes because I have a football experience, I almost see God grabbing Jesus' face mask and saying, look, Jesus, I need you to go down to earth, and here's what I need you to do. You're going to die. You're going to die on a cross. It's going to be painful. It's going to stink. It's going to be awful. You're going to never want to do those things. You're going to be so distraught over it that you're going to drop sweats of blood, drops of blood from your head because you're going to be so distraught over what's going to happen. But I need you to do this. And if you do this, we can save the world. Today we remember that event. We remember how Jesus came to earth because you and I are sinners. And we needed a savior. And we needed someone that would come and die for us to save us. Before he died, he gave us this remembrance. He gave us some bread. He gave his disciples the bread. And they taught us to take the need for this is my body. And then he took a cup. And he said, this is my spilt blood. Drink this for the forgiveness of sins. Father, I thank you so much for guys like like Floyd Thomas that influenced me in such a positive way. Lord, right now, I thank you so much for your son who influenced me in a greater way than anyone ever could by teaching me how to be, how to live, and what to do. We love you, Jesus. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of one thing. Think you're like what I've heard Tender whisper of love In the dead of night And you tell me That you're pleased And that I'm never alone You're a good, good father To you are, to you are Cause you know Oh, uh-huh.
Please be seated. Good morning, 3C. Um, Today, uh, I'm so happy uh, that uh, Eric was able to join me uh, last week. Eric Ely, if you were here uh, last week, you got to see him uh, come and join me on stage. So we're we're doing things a little different, and I'm going to, if you've been with us, uh, you know that we have been on this journey of reading through the Gospel of Mark, learning from Jesus, trying to imitate Jesus, uh, follow him as if uh, we were one of his disciples, because we are. And uh, so hopefully you've been journeying along through uh, Mark with us. We've encouraged everyone to read on their own uh, the chapter, because we're not going to cover all of the chapter, every every verse of every chapter um, on Sunday morning. So we want you to kind of see the fuller picture and bigger journey. And, and he, I don't know if you know this, I've said it a few times, uh, Joan Patrick, if you guys don't know Joan, uh, you do know Joan more than likely. Uh, Joan has been trying to pick which section of the uh, scripture I'm going to use of that chapter each week. So it's been a little game. And she, she texts me on Friday and say, which one are you doing? Which one? And I was like, ah, oh, you got to wait till Sunday. You got to wait till Sunday. The suspense. And I know Joan hates suspense. But here's the deal. You know, I say we're not going to read uh, every verse of every chapter. But here's part of the spin this week. Uh, Joan, you win. You know how I know you win? Because I'm reading all of Mark 13, okay? <laughs> and uh, I, that, we, well, I'll have, you'll have to hunker down with me. We're going to read the whole thing um, because it really doesn't have parts to it. You know, sometimes we have to remember that these uh, letters and these accounts and st- stuff did not come with chapters and little notations about what that chapter, it didn't even come with numbers that indicate verses or chapters and this sort of thing. It just was a written document. And sometimes it, uh, I, I personally disagree with whoever decided to break it up, but in this chapter, there's not different sections. It's just about one whole thing, okay? One whole thing. And so I, I wanted to just like skirt around it or skip it or this sort of thing, but I think it's a topic that it really touches on, on our times with the stuff going on around the world, this is a topic that comes up more and more. Um, the older we get, uh, you know, we uh, talk about the possible return of Jesus and, and this sort of thing. And, and that's oftentimes what people think this scripture is about. Now, before we jump into Mark uh, 13, I, I want to I make a few apologies, okay, ahead of time. And, and so hopefully you'll forgive me ahead of time. But one is to anyone who might be here who doesn't identify as a Jesus follower or a Christian quite yet. Because this, uh, this sometimes this teaching, this chapter, this will seem weird. It's going to seem weird to a Christian because of the style of literature that's used and the style of language that Jesus chooses, the kind of uh, way it's communicated. It's just a, it's just honestly in a foreign language, but it's even a different style of talking and communicating than we're used to. It's, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that here more in a second. So I apologize because things can look a little weird. And uh, sometimes you, you might think that anyway about us, but we're good with that. Uh, two, I'm going to apologize. So if you're, that's for if you're not a follower of Jesus. This is for if you are a follower of Jesus. I'm going to apologize to you too. So I'm covering all my bases this morning. I'm apologizing, apologizing to everybody. But I'm apologizing to, especially to anyone who has a deep fascination with eschatology, otherwise known as the, uh, the second coming of Jesus or the end times. I, I love you and I like you, but I'm probably going to say things that you you disagree with. Uh, and, and that's probably the way we should get used to things. We, we're we not going to agree on everything, and that should be pretty common. Uh, and I believe it's it's the, the, the view and perspective I take is one that's shared by many others, but it's also sometimes highly controversial. And, and I always like to say, hey, it's our job is to try to shed light, not heat. And that's a difficult balance to make sometimes is when you're talking about something that is near and dear to somebody's heart. Um, 
And sometimes uh, what, what some people think Mark 13 is about uh, is, is not what I think it's about. So we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. And, and then the last thing is this, time. I'm, I'm going to apologize right now because I do not have the time it takes to really uh, dive into this bigger issue uh, um, on Sunday morning. Uh, I always uh, joke with Dave, and Dave and I get back and forth on my, trying to keep me on time, and that is a difficult task, is it not? So I'm not even going to try to be exhaustive when we talk about Mark chapter 13 today. I, I'm going to cover uh, some of the highlights and, and, and high level stuff that I, I think in uh, what my reading and my interpretation of that. But some of you may disagree with me, and I would love to have a conversation about that. So here's my email. If I think of, if we have it here, email me. And let's set up a time to chat. If you want to chat about this stuff or any other time about any other thing in terms of spiritual, your walk, your faith, this sort of thing, this is my email. Uh, take a picture of it, write it down, whatever you want to do. But if you're it really interested in talking about what what we, at the end of the message, a little bit more and have more questions, I encourage you to do so. My job is not to tell, you know, everyone what they want to hear, right? Uh, it's not to even entertain. Uh, my job is to try to teach Scripture uh, t- to the best of my knowledge and wisdom. And that doesn't mean I know it all. For sure, uh, but it, it's our job to teach Scripture's truth, whether we we want to touch on the subject or not. We want to address the truth involved in this and encourage people uh, to love one another, to trust God in, in this way. And so, I, I don't know how well we know each other personally yet. I know I know many of you very well and getting to know better, but uh, I'm not one to skirt around the issue. Um, and especially when it comes. And so if there was a different section of Mark 13, I probably would have picked it, right? (laughs) Because this one just takes so much time. But there's not. All of Mark 13 is about the same subject. And so I'm stuck. I got to talk about it, right? And so here we go. So one of the points I want to make is that not only am I willing to face you know, this, and we're going to talk about tough things, we'll talk about awkward things. We'll talk about things that, that make us feel inconvenient if it's what Jesus is talking about. If it's what Jesus is talking about, it's what we're going to talk about. We're going to face our fears when he talks about these things that we're afraid of. We're going to talk about the things that make us feel awkward, uh, make us feel inc- inconvenient, that make us feel uncertain or unknown, and we're going to just try to head, head um, face uh, head on, sorry, uh, and so, but it doesn't mean we, I, or we know anything. All right, so a little exercise here, right? I want to do a little exercise, so humor me a little bit. This is this involves participation from the crowd, so just don't sit on your hands here, okay? I want you to, th- you don't have to speak out loud. I'm not going to call anybody up on stage. Just participate in your seat, but I want to know the subject that you know most about. What is the subject or topic that you know most about? What is the thing you know the most of? You don't have to know more than your neighbor or the person sitting next to you. It's just the thing that you know most of, all right? So it could be uh, mechanics. It could be uh, engineering. It could be um, baseball or, you know, uh, football. It could be uh, sewing. It could be any hobby that you have. It doesn't matter what the subject, it doesn't matter if it's spiritual or, or not. It could be a TV show. It, it, you know, whatever you know the most trivia about, just identify it in your head. What is the thing that you know most about? Anybody want to volunteer what they know most about? No, nobody does. Come on, one or two. Yes, Mabel. English. Okay, the English language. All right, that's good. Anybody else? Crafts. Okay, I see the craft maker. My there. We sh- I should have had an email ready for Becky and said, hey, here you go. Get all the crafts. Um, so anybody else? One more. Gardening. Okay, here's the thing. No matter what the subject is, Now the question is, what percentage, what percentage of all there is to know, I mean every nook and cranny, 
of the subject that you know most about, the thing that you know most about, what percentage of all there is to know about that subject do you know? What percentage of the subject that you picked in your head of all there is to do? If it's baseball, we're talking about every player that ever existed. We're talking about uniforms. We're talking about batting styles. We're talking about ERAs and every stat there ever was. It, you know, I don't even want to get some of these other ones. I'll just mess up totally. But if it's cars, it's transmissions, it's brakes, it's uh, interior, it's everything there is to know about cars. Uh, whatever it is, what percentage... Do you know, and you don't, have to, you don't have to tell me what topic it was, but I need one or two examples from other people. Of what percentage, if you're being honest, do you know about the subject that you just had in your head? One percent? Maybe one percent. Do you mind telling us the subject or no? Gardening. What else? Who else? <laughs> I knew that was going to be some guy, and it had to be you. He said 110%. <laughs> Here's the thing. It doesn't really matter. The, the truth is, if we're being honest, if we're being real honest, that's a pretty low percentage. Most people on most subjects don't feel bad. List a single-digit percentage of the thing they know most about. The thing you know most about may be in the single digits. So we should carry ourselves right, with a posture of humility. It's all the more reason we need each other. It's all the more reason we need God and his wisdom because we are very limited in what we do know. And certainty oftentimes is the enemy of faith, but we'll get into that another time. But now that we've set the posture of that we don't know everything, and we don't need to know everything, I I'm about to do what I never do, okay? And, and that is give you the, the answer, or what, give you the straight thoughts. I like to dance around them a little bit, right? I like to lead us to it. I like to ask a lot of questions and tell a lot of stories. I don't like to give you the straight answer. And the reason and I've learned this from Jesus, because that's what he does. Rarely does Jesus give you a straight answer. He wants you to wrestle with it. He wants you to, to, to uh, explore it. Think about it for yourselves. Because if you, it's just like at a test. Remember when you used to cram for tests in, in high school or college? You crammed for it the night before. Did you learn it? Did you absorb it? No. You just wanted to get it in fast enough so you could spit it back out on a, on a test paper, right? And then you just forget about all about it. Jesus doesn't want that. Jesus doesn't want us to be full of trivia that we could spit out in one moment. He wants us to absorb his truths. To, to, to not just know it, but to live it and to absorb it. And so what I'm about to do is something I try not to do, but I, I want to provide what I think is the perspective on, on Mark 13 that is, that is the best or most accurate reading, in my opinion. And that is this. What we're about to read in Mark chapter 13 is not about the end times. It is not about uh, the rapture. It is not about the second coming. It is not about seven-year tribulations or millenniums or anything like that, whether you're, you're, you know, all this sort of thing. This is about an incident that happened uh, just a little while later after Jesus speaks it uh, to Jerusalem and to the temple specifically. And so I want to say that up front because I think it, will, it helps when we read it, and hopefully you're reading it on your own, but as we read it together, I think it'll provide a perspective. And there's, there's, there'd be questions raised. And like I said, I don't have time to cover all that, but I think it gives a healthy perspective going into the reading as opposed to just talking about that and leading us to it afterward. So here's what I'm going to do. <sighs> Hunker down, Right? I'm about to read 37 verses of scripture. That's not a bad thing. I'll try to read it with a little life and inflection here, right? But uh, 
If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to get them out on your phones and the version Bible app, all this sort of thing. Use anything you want, but it should be up on the screen. And if you want, just read along with me. Uh, don't take my word for, <laughs> for it. Uh, it's right here in Mark chapter 13. So read it with this idea that about 40 years later, Rome is going to attack Jerusalem, tear down its walls, and tear down the temple. I mean the temple is gone. And then we'll talk about what that feels like to the people who's, he's telling this to. So just notice, Mark chapter 13. Because, and again, the controversial part is that some people would interpret this differently uh, than what I just said. But anyway, Mark chapter 13, verse 1, here we go. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And, and what will be the sign and, and, and that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines, and these are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must be first preached to all nations. Wherever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what, is, uh, what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother, will betray brother to death, and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does uh, not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let, let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in the winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never be equaled again. And if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. And at that time, if anyone says to you, look here, the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the son, Jesus borrows, I'm going to pause just for a second here, take a little breath. Jesus already has been borrowing from imagery, already painted in the Old Testament. Here are some direct quotes from Isaiah, but he's borrowing imagery from uh, Daniel. He's borrowing imagery from Ezekiel, especially. And we're about to talk about a fig tree. And remember, that just happened a few uh, uh, chapters earlier, but it also is uh, uh, talked about in Ezekiel as well. But here's the, this is what he's quoting from Isaiah. I've told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall, fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the four ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. 
As soon as its twigs get tender and leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not certainly pass away until all the things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. About that day or hour, no one knows, not even angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know uh, when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task. And he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. And if he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Can we take a deep breath out? It's like, it's heavy stuff. It's, It's different sounding language. But again, and again, I, I don't normally like to do this, but I think the, the perspective on that gives a different uh, lens in which to look at this scripture. But, but my reading and my studies and my interpretation of what we just read is not about the end times. Jesus is prophesying about a, 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 an event that will happen in about 40 years that is oftentimes known uh, is the destruction of the temple. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple is a historic event that happens in 70 AD. That where Rome, uh, it's the first part of a Jewish-Roman war where Rome sieges the city of Jerusalem and tears down the whole city, but most importantly uh, to them, uh, the the temple. And and so... Uh, from my reading, when we read this, we're not reading about end times or judgment day or or a rapture or anything else. Uh, we're we're looking uh, we're looking at Jesus predicting an event that will happen around forty years after he's speaking. This is what Jesus is doing: is preparing his disciples for what they're about to go through, because this is not going to be fun them. Now we we brush this off and some of us may have never even heard of the destruction of the temple uh, of 70 AD uh, and the Roman siege of Jerusalem. Some of us have heard about it and just kind of brush it off like it uh, you know it's another historical event and we're in New Testament time so I don't know that it matters all that much but, but to these disciples, these people and remember Mark's saying that Jesus is just talking to an intimate crowd here. Peter James, John, and Andrew. So Mark is accounting that there's just four in this conversation that Jesus is sharing all this with. But he is sharing it with them so that they will be prepared to go through what they're about to go through. And for us, oftentimes it doesn't seem like that big a deal. But to them, these disciples, this was huge. Remember, Jesus is saying these things about Jerusalem, and the temple, which are the epicenter of their faith to this point. The the epicenter of the Israelite culture, the Israelite way, and the Israelite faith. Remember, Jesus is only teaching this a few here. So everyone, and Gentiles, and, and that's a word for anybody who's not a Jew, Gentiles are really not a part of the picture. Everyone Jesus is talking to in in this moment and share this with is an Israelite and has an Israelite world view on Jerusalem, on their faith, on their Jewish faith, and the temple as well. They, They have an Israelite perspective and world view on God, on government, on Jerusalem, on the temple. And this was holy ground them. This was the holy city of Jerusalem. This was the temple of God. And Jesus is telling them that this would be wiped out, torn down, that not one stone will be upon the other one. And for them, this is inconceivable because it's not just 
the, the destruction of brick and mortar. It is a destruction and a deconstruction of their faith in many ways. How could these holy places, the, these places that house the presence of God, be destroyed and that be what God wanted? Remember, remember the feeling you had at 9-11? Hopefully most of you are, not hopefully, but I think most of us are old enough to remember that experience pretty vividly. We, we felt all kinds of emotions. We felt violated. We felt attacked. We th- felt threatened. We, we were scared because we didn't know what was coming. Things were uncertain. There was lots of questions about the future. Were there going to be more waves of attacks? And, and just not, just, and, and, with, and that's all pretty much without a religious or faith bent to it. But it felt like, in many ways, at that time, the end of the world. And some of us asked about that. And and now imagine if you had been a New Yorker. Imagine if you lived in New York. And maybe you have relatives, or maybe you yourself has ties to to people uh, in New York, and you have indirectly felt the the, the gravity of that situation and what it must have felt like to be in New York City when that was happening, when those buildings were crumbling. And that's what 70 AD felt like to an Israelite. It, it, it felt like the end of the world. It felt like uh, lots of things. And, and then you're talking about their faith tied to it. And Jesus is telling these things ahead of time so that they may persevere, so that they may overcome, so that they may know that this is not the end of the faith. This is just part of what you will face when you are a follower of Jesus. And that's it. That's it. That's what this entire passage is about, Mark 13. And I'm sure people who read this Scripture have, have particular questions, and there are practical ones, and there, there are ones that, uh, that are, require deep conversations. But in a nutshell, that is it. Jesus is bracing, and remember, according to Mark, it's just his four friends here at the time. Two sets of brothers, James and John, Peter and Andrew. Let me tell you, guys, and remember, this is the weekly few days before Jesus dies. And so they're about to face a lot. And he has told them he's going to die a couple times, and they're not just getting it. And he wants them to know what all they're about to face. He didn't tell everyone this, but he told a few to prepare them for what it's going to be like in the days to come. And for good, to overcome evil circumstances, for, for your faith to persevere a deconstruction of what you thought was holy. I, I wonder if some of us in this room need a similar message. So, but what about the end times, you know? Oftentimes when people read these scriptures uh, that we think and, and maybe have been taught at times about that this is regarding the end times, and it's not as if that isn't going to happen. It's just that this isn't about that. But when we encounter scriptures that sound and look like this, it's almost always a style called apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature. But even the name of that sounds like it's about the end of the world, right? Right? Because when we hear the word apocalypse, we think end of the world. We think that's not what it means at all. Apocalypse means a revelation. It means a revealing. And so that's when you see the, the, the only time uh, the word is used, uh, it's in the book of Revelation because it's a revelation. That's what it means. That's what John is experiencing. But you hear apocalyptic style literature, which is just a revelation about what is a prophecy, about what is to happen, and it's usually tied to God's judgment. 
And you hear it from Daniel, you hear it from Ezekiel, you hear it from Isaiah, you hear it from Jeremiah, you hear it from a few texts within the Old Testament talking about the hard things they face. And if you read the Old Testament, you know God's people have to overcome hard things. And that's what apocalyptic literature is for is to, to share symbols of what is to come and warn the children of God that they will face hard times and they will overcome. It, it's a foreign type language. It's almost like trying to describe uh, uh, the television to someone in the first century. It would just be really foreign concept. You, you could try, but it'd be tough, right? Now, I don't... I don't know how many of you know uh, Tom Frisney. Tom Frisney was a former member here, an elder here at a different time, but he was a longtime professor at uh, CCU, at Cincinnati Christian University, formerly known as Cincinnati Bible College and Seminary, formerly, just formerly. <laughs> if you know the story, it's a sad one. But uh, Tom was a member here, an active and teacher and this sort of thing. I had... Uh, Mr. Frisney for Revelation, right, in school. Boy, you want to talk about a fun class. Revelation. In our only assignment, that, that cruel man, right, he gave us one assignment, and that was this, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on Revelation. Your only assignment was to write a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on on the 21 chapters of Revelation. That's it. That's it. So for every line, every verse in Revelation, I had to write about a paragraph. Now, he was kind enough to give you a, a structure. If you wanted to stay on task and on time for the whole semester and complete it on time, he would give you all these due dates that if you met this on time, you would stay on track and you'd have it done by the end of the semester. It didn't make it any worse, okay? It was tough. It was brutal, but it taught me a lot. But the major theme of this apocalyptic literature is this. In Revelation, it is the overcoming of the saints, that the saints are called to overcome the evil that they will battle against. I had another professor say it this way. He, he summed up uh, end-time prophecies this way, which in, included revelation and apocalyptic literature. He said this, listen, here's three points of uh, the whole uh, end-time prophecies or prophecies uh, of uh, ap apocalyptic literature. It is, one, good eventually triumphs over evil. That's point number one. Good triumphs over evil. Okay. Point number two, pick a side. You want to be on the good side or the bad side? Pick a side. Okay. That's your number two point. So good triumphs over evil. Number two, pick a side. His number three point was don't be stupid. Okay, good will face evil and triumph over evil. Two, you got to pick a side. Whose side are you going to be on? And three, don't be stupid when you pick a side. This was the message of apocalyptic literature. is to remind you and encourage you to be on the side of good. Because good wins. Good overcomes. And there are going to be chapters in life that it doesn't feel that way. It's going to, there are going to be chapters in life that feels like evil's going to win. They will overcome. And it's just there to remind you. We knew hard stuff would happen in this world, but good will overcome. What side are you going to pick? And that's our call to be agents of good news, to be agents of overcoming in the face of evil. And when you hear 
the, the words of uh, apocalyptic literature or the, uh, the sounds of it. It's not meant to scare you. It's not to, meant to, um, you know, to dis, distract you from, from other, you know, type, end of the world type stuff. It is there to encourage you to overcome. Becky Halcom sent me a, a tweet uh, this week that she came across, and I don't have it on the screen, uh, but it said this, God does not give us the book of Revelation so we'd build bomb shelters in the backyard. He gave us this book so we'd big, build bigger dinner tables to invite our friends over and tell them about Jesus. Now, we will be influenced. There, what ticks me off uh, is um, the people who profit from the scare tactics of end time drama. Uh, I wish that I had a list of the people who profited for in the year leading up to the year 2000, teaching about the, the, the end of the world. Uh, Armageddon is coming. 2000, that was 22 years ago, right? And they profited all kinds on sermons or messages or material or teachings and, and book sales and this sort of thing. And it angers me because I want them to put all that money back because they've used fear to talk about what should have been love. And I have to bite my lip because our overcoming isn't about uh, guns and, and uh, stocking up. It's about love. That when we fight our battles as representatives of God's kingdom, we do not fight them the way the world fights them. We fight them the way God has called us, and that is with love. That is with love. Now, see, I, I, there's way too many tangents I could go on, and I don't have time to go on all of them. But let me warn uh, all of us about some traps that happen uh, inside of this. And real quickly, um, one, inside of these kind of conversations, uh, we have a desire to be right and have all the answers. Okay? We have a desire to want to be right and have all the answers. And I just want to remind you of our little survey that we took earlier. Of how much you know about the thing you know most about. The thing you know most about. We're not going to have all the answers, and we're certainly not going to have all the answers about the end times. Look at what Jesus says, even if you believe that. He says, uh, uh, about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels, not heaven, nor son, uh, uh, but only the Father. No one knows. Jesus is saying, I don't know. And somehow other people are trying to convince us that they know. Not the, not the only one who knows is the Father, not angels, not anyone, not even me, he said. But we, we sometimes split up on that. And this, this trying to get it right has been so detrimental. It's why you see so many churches in this small town. It's because we thought we had to get it right. And you've heard me say it before, that it's more important to be loving than it is to be right. Because when you, again, another but the reason we're all split up, one of my favorite church splits in church history, you read about it. This is what Bible college geeks do. You read about church history and that sort of thing. One of them split over uh, taking communion uh, in, from one cup. You know, this is before they even knew about germs, but they used to drink communion from one cup and then just pass it around, right? Take it away, and then we're, we're going to do separate. The big controversy was the tobacco juice getting backwashed back into the cup. Now that'll split a church right there. <laughs> but we fight about so much ridiculous stuff when the message is love. When the mission is love. We don't have to be right about a hundred things to love people. We don't have to know everything to love people. And that in all things, Paul says later, it all comes back to love. The second point here is an overemphasis on information instead of imitation. Listen, I, I'm, uh, 
my goofy nature may not seem like that I'm a geek out on Bible. If you were to pick me out of the class as a kid, there's no way you would have said, then there's a future preacher. And those of you who have gotten to know me and gotten to know me well, you know that's true. There's no way that they predicted that little son of a gun is going to be a preacher. But I, I can get into the trap of information being the key. If I just have the right answers, then I can argue with you and convince you. And what I've learned is I, I am way more effective as a disciple maker. I am way more effective on a, as, a, uh, as a minister, as a disciple of Jesus, if I focus on imitating Jesus instead of, instead of gathering information. It's not that information isn't a good thing. It is. But here's the information we need to, to remember here. That the theme of Mark 13 is the overcoming saints. That you are called to fight evil with good. Right? To fight evil with good. And so you all need that to be your focus. Right? Eyes right here for a second. Your battle is to fight evil with good. That is what the urgent, when Jesus talks about the urgent call, when leaving the, 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 the home to put the servants in charge, and he gives them all a task, the task is to overcome evil with good. I may get killed. I'm going to end with this story. Um, the Joe and Eric Ely are in our, our community group, and, and and this past week, Joe, who, and we had Eric up here last week. You think Eric doesn't want to be in the spotlight. Joe definitely doesn't want to be in the spotlight. So she may kill me for this. But she told a story that happened years ago when she was at, uh, going into a grocery store and turning left. And she was being conservative with the traffic coming on. And the person behind her didn't feel like she was going quick enough. And so that person laid on the horn. And so Joe heard that and felt like a little, I can't believe they honked at me, you know, that sort of thing. And you know what she did? She did what every red-blooded American would do. She let a few more cars pass by, you know, just a few extra. Uh, you want to honk at me, I'll show you. You know, we're going to, and then the ladies honking and that sort of thing. They get in the grocery store and they have a little confrontation. Joe's daughter, Nikki, said, you made my mom cry, you know, this sort of thing. Because she was so upset that this woman was upset with her. But you know what Joe did? She found her in the grocery store and said, you know, I want to apologize. I, I'm sorry. I I did let a few people go past me and I just want to tell you I, I'm, I'm sorry for doing that and I just didn't want there to be any lingering hard feelings between us and, and Joe was crying while she was doing this and the woman said I'm so sorry I said you have no idea what I'm going through my mom's on her deathbed I'm trying to watch my kids the kids were screaming about not having anything to eat I had to run to the grocery store meanwhile I'm just trying to get back to my mom to take care of her and I'm just overwhelmed and the two of them embraced in this tearful but repentant posture and I just want I would just wonder if we didn't take Joe attitude a little bit more not the one that let the cars go by <laughs> attitude but the one that sought her out and just said it didn't matter if she felt like she was right she just knew it was a loving thing to do what are you facing this week that is apparent evil that is evil in your life evil in this world evil in attitude and spirit and in deed. And will you succumb to try to fight evil with evil or will you trust the message of the overcoming saint who fights evil with good, who represents the kingdom of God 
as an agent of good news, not evil. Let's pray. God, uh, forgive us when we don't act in love and represent you well. Forgive us when we get our defenses up and our posture is, is defensive. Forgive us when we prioritize being right over loving. Forgive us, Lord. Thank you for your warnings that things in this life are not going to be easy. Thank you for the warning you gave your disciples that they were about to face real, devastating, hard circumstances. And that you're, the reason you told them this is the same reason you told John what you told him in Revelation. Is you wanted to prepare us for what was to come so that we could be ready to overcome evil with good. So as we're tempted to respond with evil, Lord, help us to be reminded that we are representing you and you are good. You are love. So help us to represent you well and overcome the evils that we face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, 3C. We'll see you next week.
the blood of love. 